DiscerningHearts.com presents And Mary's Yes continues afresh with Sister Joseph Andrew Bogdanowitz. Sister Joseph Andrew is the vocation director and one of the founders of the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. Our conversations in this series flow from And Mary's Yes Continues Afresh, a book published by the community that offers a deeper understanding and appreciation of the life-giving vocation of religious sisters and their role in our world today. And Mary's Yes Continues Afresh with Sister Joseph Andrew Bogdanowitz. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. And the thing is, there is a a recognition of a disquietude that comes in, you know, that restlessness. I mean, of course, St. Augustine speaks in our hearts. Oh, I love St. Augustine. Well, we have his rule as Dominicans. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is that 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 feeling sometimes we try to respond in other ways. And and again, going back to the call, he is calling their women today, uh, you know, his daughters to... He has something very special, and it is that that moment when the soul is able to find the quiet because of the fiat, of the yes. It, even like with the Blessed Mother, she had that moment where um, she had a question. Yes. How can this yes. be? And it's okay to have questions, mm-hmm. but to be able, once she had that, you know, it was all in. Yes, that fiat changed salvation history. <laughs> and this, the it's not dissimilar, is it, than the yes that uh, you made at the time of your vows? I mean, but you you got, um, or for any other who is trying to respond to that call, and you, that's your number one job is to help them exactly. be able to identify exactly what the voice is asking them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, Chris, I absolutely love my job, my mm-hmm. obedience, whatever we want to say, um, the, the role God has, has asked of me. Um, and I've had it, well, in this community since it began. And I just get to see so much the interior desires, I would say, of young people. And I would say men and women, because both mm-hmm. certainly come, obviously, more so women, but that um, I remember when John Paul II went to Poland June 9th and his, his very first um, time he ever went back home after being the Pope. Um, and at a particular time when he was speaking in Victory Square and all of a sudden he was interrupted, so to speak, by the humongous crowd just saying over and over, we want God, we want God. And there were the communists ready to shoot, should anybody get out of order, et cetera. And no one did. And they just kept it up for like 10, 12, 15 minutes. And I I crystallized that in my mind constantly, not just for myself, which I know it's true, but for everyone, whether or not they know God, they want him. Or for those who do know him, but don't really admit of his love, et cetera. Or for those who know him a little bit, but are afraid because they realize they really don't have this relationship. And so everyone that I meet, I'm thinking in my mind, they're just shouting at me. I want God. Can you help me? Can you be that spiritual mom to show me God? And um, in, in the, the beauty of working with all these multiple, multiple thousands of young people every single year, that's what really comes across. And the present generation as any generation, but, but it does change through time. And, and so we have this book and Mary's Yes Continues Afresh, which is the second volume. The Afresh part is new because the first volume and Mary's Yes Continues was produced by the community five years ago. And in five years, I can write how things have changed. And so I, I really do see how things have changed and and they evolve in young people. And certainly, um, you know, the statisticians show show how they evolve by generation. Well, they're going towards that generation, obviously the entire time, the other one, 
um, in it. And so it, it's kind of a progressive thing, but I can see, I can kind of put my finger, so to speak, on the heartbeat of the young people and see the strengths and see the weaknesses and try to kind of alert them to both as they personally manifest, deal with their own, but it's all usually a part of this bigger picture called what society and the culture and adults and the world they're going into and the, um, the apparatuses that they are that are placed in their hands from, you know, almost before they can read, they're old and an iPhone of somebody's and noticing everybody else has a major attachment to this thing. And so they're reading, I should have an attachment to one. Um, and it just continues on and on and on. And I just think it's so important to diffuse from that um, the fears that is God going to be gone if I push the off button or is God going to be gone if I stop the conversation or how is God so present because they're not growing up in a society or culture and many don't have the religious moms, the sisters teaching them, etc. So how do they learn? They have to learn somehow to love God. And in many ways, I think that's my role, just to open up their, their hearts to be able to say, I'm weak, I'm fallible, I'm selfish, I'm, I have these problems, et cetera, but I also have these deep desires and I have this, um, I, I want to become a saint, I want, to, I want my life to be filled with God. And I want to do for others everything that I possibly can. And when you begin pointing these things out there, the first question they will say to me is, how do you know me so well? And I'm like, well, honey, we're all kind of like that. But you hit things, sister, that nobody's ever said to me. You hit them and where I'm weak. But you also gave me such hope. And people might on occasion attack the weakness and I realize that that's pretty transparent to them, but not many people will ever see the desires in my heart. And I think really, Chris, that's where the young people are crying out for someone to love them. Whenever that does happen, I'm like, honey, you just exude your desire for goodness and holiness. And they're like, sister, nobody's ever said that to me before. How do you see that in me? It's never, oh, you're wrong. I don't have those desires. It's how do you see that in me? Nobody's ever said that. And then they are become free to, as we say, discern. What is the way you're called to give your heart away to another? Who's the, who's the other? And for that one to give his heart, or if it be a, a guy, obviously her heart, to give the other heart back to you so that there can be a completion interiorly of the desires of your heart, meaning God, you know, the completion of our hearts, God. And so they, they're freed up to say, I want to do it. And I would say of the women that first come to me for discernment, and these are already thinking maybe religious life or they probably wouldn't be coming. I mean, they, they certainly are open. Um, I would say a good, at least 80 to 85% of those have either a married vocation or a consecrated to a, a life consecrated virginity. Um, and they don't have a religious vocation, but for them, they don't even know the distinctions. And it's like, if I want to give everything to God, it has to be a religious vocation. I go, no, your holiness is the vocation God is asking you to accept as a gift from him. And he's planned it from all eternity and he's done change his mind. So you have to find yours. And that's like, wow, I have the total freedom so I can become as holy as a wife and mom or a consecrated virgin as I can as a religious sister. Yes, if you, if you become holy, you will become holier in your own vocation than you will in trying to fake it in another, which eventually you won't be able to do anyway, and you'll end up leaving. So let's try to hit this correctly. Well, they have a whole new aspect of the beauty of marriage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that people aren't really telling them about. Like I can become a tremendous saint getting married and raising my children. I'm like, of course, if that's God's will, 
But people aren't out there saying this. And again, they've already been heightened to the awareness of I, this individual, believe I must become a saint. And I have to do this well and I have to do this correctly. So sister help. It's so beautiful to see their own openness to, to holiness and their desire for it. And they're capable of huge sacrifices. Um, sometimes they just really do amaze me. But again, I think that's every single person out there. And as you said, Chris, if we stop and think of how many people don't know this because they don't encounter someone who stops them and shows this beautiful aspect of God's overflowing love for them, um, it's sad. And so we need more preachers and teachers and, 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 and faithful laity. We need more religious women, the moms out there, the spiritual moms out there. We need priests who love their vocation and live their vocation in their, as we had said earlier, in their own manly genius. Mm -hmm. So I give talks all the time on feminine genius and I'm always like, but we will only be as good as the masculine geniuses too, because it takes okay. two. And that balance pulls me even into more of my own and pulls him into more of his own. Yeah. What I'm hearing you say too, sister, is that, that discernment, that listening, that deep listening is, and, and really the definition of obedience is the deep listening. It's yes. the deep hearing. What is it you're asking of me, Lord? The church is stronger. Exactly. Anytime anyone does that, you know, the Christian, the Christian church, period, Catholic faith, the Catholic church, all of that, it's stronger when the, when the members are engaged in that listening. It's so true. You know, Chris, it, when you said that, I thought immediately to, um, you know, probably my favorite feast in many ways, uh, not necessarily, I mean, there's saints that are my favorites that don't, but the martyrs, the ones that just give it all. I mean, um, to the point of really heroic sacrifice. And again, that can be white martyrdom or red martyrdom. But when I think of the martyrs and I think what the witness of one martyr does for the church and it ripples out, or I think of uh, what one I would consider, because we have to be martyred one way or another. So a white martyr, which is St. Teresa, the child Jesus. And why would I say that? If we really know her and we, we read her life, I mean, from early on, she had a very unusual graces um, and she had very unusual sacrifices and sufferings, even in her health, if we can't think of anything else. And we can think of really a lot. And dying at the age of 24 and being a doctor of the church, you know, she put a lot into a short amount of time. So she had to be very intense with her holiness. Um, and th those were God's graces to her. But when I think of that, I think, you know, like St. Teresa, she never desired to be known or to go outside her convent or anything. And here she is the universal patron of missionaries <laughs> throughout the world. Yep. And I think God always thinks with the full picture. And so we get hung up on the, the small picture, be that usually the worst hang up, the small picture of myself. But if we can get beyond that, um, God just has a way of effusing through us his love and mercy and goodness and, um, and a very luring ability to get others to come to the same source, you know, um, a curiosity and interest, whatever. Uh, we were founded in 1997 under, um, well, under John Paul II. He's the one who formed the community, but uh, John Cardinal O'Connor in New York, who I would canonize in a heartbeat. I've got those sure. canonized and he's certainly one of them. Um, but I remember him telling us one time that when he was made a, a cardinal by the Holy Father, he was leaving the, the Vatican and walking out into the piazza and this little tiny diminutive nun comes up and she looks at him and he just looks at her and all she says to him is, give God permission. And then she goes away. Well, that was Mother Teresa. <laughs> but if we just gave God permission or St. Ignatius, founder of the Jesuits, would say, no one has any idea of the greatness to which they could become if they would 
only let God live in them well and just quit worrying about themselves. Um, there's, you know, there is that whole thing of how sometimes small we, we can be tempted to see God when in reality, it's not even the drop in the ocean. It's a minuscule, you know, H2O period, let alone a whole drop of them compared to the inf infinity of God's love and wisdom. And that too, and you brought this out early and I just wanted to mention this before I forget it. Um, you, you referred to speaking to other Dominicans and priests, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and that they're always pretty loquacious and that they're going to follow the, um, the manly logic if they're the men, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I love to think that my order, the Dominican order, was founded really on our proper use of the active life of the mind. You know, so we would say, obviously, it's very toss, or it's a motto of the order, it's truth, who is God, but that the fact that he gave us a mind, and I think we're living in a day and age too, and perhaps this is also one of the reasons we're getting so many vocations, because we teach this, use your mind, and you are responsible for it. Um, but I think we're living in a day and age too, where everything has flipped from using my mind to using my emotions. I won't even say heart because to me, that's not the heart. That's mm -hmm. me mixed in to plan what I want to become versus mm -hmm. me standing there and receiving from God. And so, and we learned this um, by making our own mistakes and being honest before God and self-knowledge is essential. And I certainly pray for an increase of that constantly, but but there's so little respect for truth, objective truth. So Pope Benedict, of course, um, had his terminology for it, which we certainly all understand. Um, and, and basically, it's you take anything and you twist it the way that fits you and act like that's the way it is. And in truth, we're missing out that God alone is objective truth. And that if I sway off that, I'm not in the realm of truth anymore. And so we have to get back to thinking and being responsible for our thinking and trying to educate ourselves and realizing the incredible gift that my mind is that, that distinguishes me with my immortal soul, obviously, from this animal who has instinct but can't reason. And I reason, and that's a godly gift. And I am responsible for the way that I use that. And so even in our schools, we have what we call the virtue program, education and virtue. And it's a beautiful thing. And um, all these materials, uh, we, along with our book, and Mary Just <laughs> Continues, I want to put that up there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is Anne Mary's Just Continues, a fresh volume too, can be um, obtained from our website, which is sistersofmary.org. And you can you can find these things. We're going but to have I, all of that up there. We're going to have, it, we want everyone, we want to encourage everybody you. that's listening and viewing. We want them to, to, yeah. to access this and pass them on. I just want to let yes. people know you can find them in, in the Even posts if, and yeah, everywhere. Yeah. We'll return to And Mary's Yes Continues Afresh with Sister Joseph Andrew Bogdanowitz in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, 
including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now continue with, and Mary's Yes continues afresh with Sister Joseph Andrew Bogdanowitz. A young person discerning, we have our three virtual discernment retreats up there this year. And I know that there have been over a thousand who have taken part in these discernment retreats. As I said, it's the USA is kind of small nowadays. Mm -hmm. Link Canada is still small. Link Europe, even that is still small. It's branching out to the globe. And in many ways, that has positives and negatives. But certainly, God wants it to be throughout. He said to those 12 little apostles, go out to the entire world. Now, if he's going to say that to 12, um, and I have this machine sitting in front of me, I think God is enabling me to bring him to anybody out there. And so even from the African continent and Asia, and you name it, Australian, um, you know, young people have made these retreats and tied into them and whatever they will do with their life. I think the bottom line is God is real and he really does love you infinitely. And you really do have life for a purpose. And your purpose is to get to heaven and to bring as many souls with you as you can. And I think that's the ultimate message. And if you, um, you really possess that inside yourself, you're driven in a new way and the rest of this nonsense or um, stuff that doesn't matter, a hill of beans, as we say, <laughs> it dissipates. And very quickly, you begin to learn my brain can distinguish what's important and what's not, what I really am willing to sacrifice for and what's just not worth it, where I'm willing to give my time. Um, what draws me out of myself, therefore, towards another, towards God, making me more and more the saint he was asking me to be. And then where do I make my commitment uh, to make my vows um, to live for him in this? What, what, is, what is my vocation, ultimately, to live for him in this world? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you brought up the distinction between the emotions and what's happening on the heart level, and also what everything that has been the input that comes into our brains, uh -huh. because it starts very young now. I mean, oh, yes. it, it was young before, but it really, <laughs> I mean, the day now, because of communication and exactly. the linking and the, and the same tools that is the great net that we can cast uh -huh. is also a net that is uh, being cast out by something that's not of love, of not exactly. of God, of Ignatius would say, the enemy. Exactly. And it is uh, uh, so many out there, possibly, sister, because even at the youngest age, but going into their, you know, their 20s, 30s, even 40s, they are hearing something that's saying, it's too late for you. I know. It's too late. You, you, what you've done, what you've participated in, who you are. Oh, it's too late. I know. Sorry. And that's one of the biggest lies that can be heard in, in the human heart. Exactly. And again, Chris, if we think of, and this is why the saints sh shine the light on the way. Um, 
You know, there's there's a, a quote that I sometimes use and I meditate on it a lot, and I've forgotten right now who said it, but he says, the lamp lighter in the darkest night goes and lights the lamps that others may be able to see their path. But this saint is the light mm. that goes and others follow. And, and I love that distinction. Um, are we ultimately what we say we believe? And do we really live our faith? And again, when we fall, do we get up again? Um, and there's there's just so many things that, that come into that. And um, I think too, in, in our day and age, children pattern themselves after what they see. And so I think it behooves good parents to really be careful about these things and and yet at the same time to teach them distinctions so they know how to deal with them when they come you know um I think so many times I meet girls like what you what who you just mentioned we can accept them into their very early 30s and some have such a past already and so whether or not they would be able to live religious life and many times because of their past. And, and sometimes I think that God points that uses that sometimes to point them towards a different vocation um, for healings of, of wounds and memories and many psychological um, stresses that they've had and that they carry and they need professional help for that. But whatever it may be, it's always you have a particular vocation <clears throat> and your holiness will be in living this. And so you can't keep dragging the baggage with you. At a certain point, you have to do what is necessary to as best as you can, trusting God will do the rest, dump the baggage and then go on. And again, <clears throat> we think of St. Augustine. Oh my God, goodness. And we, there's plenty of saints that we can think of that when the moment of conversion came, they dumped the baggage and they went on. And yet had the baggage influenced and already taken certain kind of roots, so to speak, in their minds and in their hearts. Yes, because of course, experiences um, make us in very large measure who we are and how we view things. But the conversion of the light being thrown on this, um, in some ways, I, I think it gave them more of an empathy towards others who were still dragging the, a similar baggage and a verbiage to express to them in a way they could maybe hear why this is dross and you want the reality and you want the good. And so many times I think conversions have a gift to be able to express in a way certain people can hear better um, because they've been there themselves. And so I don't think there's any moment, well, I know there's no moment in our life as long as we're still breathing that we can't convert and even use the time before the conversion um, to become part of a positive message that we give to the world. And sometimes people say, well, you know, I wouldn't want anybody to know my past. And many times that's, that's fine. And that's um, for good reason. And whether or not they do, but they still come with a, a depth of empathy that somebody else can say, how, how would you know this? Well, I can just understand. I can put myself in your, in your footprints and realize those two are my feet, though I haven't walked the exact same path. And I think people need that. Um, always to realize, and that's why I frequently say there's you know, all the stations of the cross, there's only one that repeats itself. And it repeats itself not only twice in case we don't get the second time, but the third time too, that we too will fall. And yet we too must get up. And every step we get up must be a step closer to the goal, to the gift of self. We'll continue our conversation in our next episode. You've been listening to And Mary's Yes Continues Afresh with Sister Joseph Andrew Bogdanowitz. To learn more about the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, visit sistersofmary.org.
www.dominicansisters.org. The website for the Order of the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. To hear and or to download this conversation along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for And Mary's Yes continues afresh with Sister Joseph Andrew Bogdanowitz.